Welcome to Church at Home. My name's Ryan and I want to welcome you to Living Waters this morning. Today, let's celebrate together. We have the opportunity to do that as community. Let's celebrate, uh, first of all, Yemen. Those of you who have given to our Yemen project, I want to thank you so much. As Living Waters, we've given over $20,000 to Yemen. That means that there's over $102,000 on the ground in Yemen with the government grant. So thank you so much, Living Waters. We can celebrate that this morning together. We can also celebrate what's happening together as we gather in our different networks, whether that's children or preteens or our youth. Uh, great things are happening as a church community. For example, we have a men's network gathering happening on November 28th that we would love to invite you out to. So Living Waters, as we go through our gathering today, let's celebrate and let's worship together. We're gonna do that right now. So let me invite you into worship together. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill us A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you
of Jesus. Well, it's the middle of November and the leaves are almost all off the trees, the weather is getting colder, and you know what that means? Christmas is approaching. Uh, I'm all ready for Christmas. I'm wearing my Christmas socks and our house is decorated. And uh, as Living Waters Church, we're looking towards uh, Christmas time and celebrating that. And one of the ways that we do that is through Helping Hands. So Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Helping Hands is about? Yeah, for sure. For, for so many years, uh, Helping Hands has been one of the great ways in which Living Waters uh, celebrates Christmas. And again, this year, even despite some of the, the the restrictions, uh, so many doors have opened up for our community to participate, uh, to help individual families, to help community groups. And I'm kind of a mind that this year is gonna be one of the better years because so many doors have opened up for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of the opportunities that we have this year for Helping Hands uh, include creating uh, hampers for families in need. Uh, we also have an opportunity to give gifts to uh, women who are in prison. And uh, we also are going to be involved in the Salvation Army Christmas kettles. And uh, another opportunity that we have is actually to serve the seniors in Fort Langley at the community uh, center there uh, by decorating uh, some of the area that they live in uh, just to help uh, make it a little, feel a little more Christmassy this year. And so one of the things that we're doing new this year uh, is an event that we're hosting here at Living Waters Church called Illuminate. And Illuminate is a drive-through food drive that we're gonna be doing the week before Christmas uh, that's also going to include a light display throughout our parking lot. And so as people come to donate food items to the Langley Food Bank, they can also drive through our parking lot and view a couple different displays that will describe and tell the story of Christmas. And so we're really excited about uh, creating that space this Christmas. Uh, even though we can't gather like we normally do at Christmas, it'll be a great opportunity for us to serve our community, uh, but also celebrate together. So we encourage you uh, to get involved in that opportunity also. So Ruben has mentioned a few of those opportunities. There's more opportunities that are on our website. And as you sign up online, you'll be contacted by a team leader and from there be able to learn about uh, the individual dates and times and individual responsibilities. It's going to be a great year. Helping Hands is awesome. And it continues uh, to remind me year after year of how generous a community we really are. And again, as we uh, lend a hand, we lend our time, we lend our hearts and our attention to people around us, uh, this Christmas, uh, we can be a tremendous blessing, which I know we will be. Yeah, it's going to be great. Just before Luke comes to preach, we're going to do the scripture reading for this morning out of Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. 
The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. But he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Hi everybody, good to be with you today. If we've not met before, my name is Luke and I'm on our pastoral team here at Living Waters. And we're gonna to continue today in the Gospel of Luke chapter eight. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to that. Uh, today we're gonna to be looking at verses 40 through 56. And I've titled this passage, these two interwoven stories, Don't Be Afraid. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld has an old joke about fear. And it goes that surveys show that many people have a number one fear. And their number one fear is of public speaking. And their number two fear is of death which he says means that some people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Now, I know that is a little bit dark, but if this year has shown us anything, it might be that a fear of public speaking no longer tops our lists of things that we're afraid of. There's a lot to be afraid of uh, these days, isn't there? Health scares, there's job loss, there's uncertainty on levels that our generation has never faced. But what are we afraid of most? What shadowy puppet master makes all those other marionettes dance? Well, in the end, for any creature, certainly human beings included, our most, our most intense fear has to be of death. We might like to, to fool ourselves into thinking that we're more afraid of public speaking or we're more afraid of, of job loss, but the fear of death is the thing that lurks behind all of it. Tolstoy called death the inevitable end of everything, which confronts us with irresistible force. Death is the one thing that none of us can do anything about. So we're terrified of death and that we're usually reluctant to own up to it. We'd rather make jokes. It's a little bit like what Woody Allen famously said. He said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't wanna be there when it happens. The more that I hear the story of Jesus healing of the woman with the blood hemorrhage and of the raising of the young girl from the dead, the more I'm convinced that this is one of those stories in the Gospels that deals with our fear of death head on. It might be uncomfortable to say out loud because we'd rather avoid talking about our fear of death or just make jokes about it, but we may as well be honest about it as scripture is honest about it. This story quite literally then asks us to stare death in the face but it also asks us to stare hope in the face. Don't be afraid, we hear Jesus say. What we've seen uh, in the surrounding stories to this one is, as we said last week, not a plush toy version of Jesus, but instead this character that's full of power and authority. The question that this story asks us today is how much power how much authority does Jesus have what it takes to handle our most primal fear of death? Remember that Jesus has just exercised calm control over the natural powers, the winds and the waves. He's demonstrated calm control over evil powers in the story about the demonically possessed man. The gospels are full of stories that unveil Jesus to us. 
And so turning our attention to this story today, these two interwoven stories of the woman with the blood hemorrhage and, and the young girl who's, who's on death's door, who is the character who's being unveiled for us today? Well, we meet a character, as we heard, which you only have to brush up against and you stop leaking life. We meet a character who goes in to see a young girl who has died, but to him, it's like she's only sleeping, even though everybody in the room laughs when he says that. But to Jesus, the wind and the waves aren't a formidable threat. A host of evil spirits is no competition. What about death? That's the kind of question that a people of faith shouldn't be afraid to ask. Because if we're not asking these kinds of questions about fear, about death, then I'm not sure what our faith is for. So here's a few questions that I think emerge from this story, amongst others, some that came to mind for me. The first question is this, what frightens us? The second question is, what do we do about that fear? And the third question is, what is faith? Let's look at that first question, what frightens us? Well, we identified earlier that the heart of all human fear is death. And that's the fear that is carried by the characters in this story. You know, we, we meet a woman with a blood hemorrhage and she's fighting for her life. And so she's doing everything she can to, to ward off death. And so she budges through the crowd and she reaches out and grabs Jesus in desperation. The religious leader that we heard about can't stand the thought of his young daughter dying. And so he rushes to Jesus in a panic. They're both afraid of death, just like we are. But as the story goes, they have no reason to be afraid of Jesus. In fact, they have reason to hope. It's important to note, however, that some people were afraid of Jesus after some of the miracles. You'll remember that fear was the reaction uh, of the people who lived on the other side of the lake after Jesus had freed the man with the evil spirits and they begged him to leave. But the Gospels make clear that, that Jesus didn't go around showing off, trying to frighten people, intending to overwhelm people. In fact, he often tried to avoid attention, and we hear the Gospels say that quite a bit. In the case of the demon-possessed man, it seems as though that Jesus didn't really have much of a choice. He was simply confronted by darkness, and as we said last week, light inevitably always evicts darkness, and sometimes that happens dramatically. The townspeople perhaps saw the muscle and missed the mercy, and then they were afraid. So maybe that's why at the end of, of this story about the raising of a young girl, that Jesus tells her parents to keep it quiet so as to not attract the wrong kind of attention. Maybe Jesus is shy about showing off his power because it gives people the wrong impression. You know, if we fast forward to Jesus' own crucifixion, to Jesus' own death, we get a much clearer picture of the impression that God wants to give the world through Jesus. And that is of humility, of service, and of sacrifice. So Jesus isn't out to, to blow people away, to overwhelm people, but to seek and save what is lost. And that's the whole Gospel of Luke, really, in a nutshell. So if miracles, we could say, can at times in the Gospels be a little bit distracting for Jesus, why does he do them in the first place? Well, back to the story. When this woman reaches out in desperation and, and hope of healing, a miracle seems to just kind of tumble out of Jesus. And he has to ask who's touched him. And this is one of those, I think, delightfully strange moments in the Gospels. 
as there's this feeling of absurd abundance at play. I heard someone once describe this kind of miracle in the gospel as, as a flash of compassion, almost like Jesus can't help himself or control the mercy that he's full of. And then when Jesus and the man with a sick daughter learns that she's died while they're en route, what does Jesus say? He says, don't be afraid. And then in the end, he raises her from the dead. I know that's a lot to take in, but the point that Luke is making here is that it's only natural to fear death, but we needn't be afraid of Jesus. And this is because Jesus isn't a fear spreader, but a hope carrier. He defies death because he is the source of life. There's this mercy and this light in Jesus that spills out wherever he goes. And so shocking is this mercy, so bright is Jesus' light, that people in darkness can at times be startled by it. And maybe that's why he's wary of people wanting to show off his power, or why he sometimes downplays miracles, asking people to keep them quiet. Jesus wasn't want to give the wrong impression that God shows up to scare or overwhelm people into obedience. Instead, he shows people that God is someone who invites trust, who invites trust and to hope in mercy. It's important, I think, also in hearing these stories uh, to say that, that miracles like the ones in Luke 8 are glimpses into a future hope. And just as the healings that that we might experience today. You know, we can make rules about miracles, but in the end, they really can't be explained. One thing I think we could say, however, about miracles is that a miracle is a kind of temporary solution as the Bible understands them. It's a temporary solution because in the end, we are all going to die, unless Christ returns first, of course. This is a little bit of a strange and, and a weak simile, but give me a chance to, to give it a go. I've come to think of miracles this side of heaven a little bit like an early Christmas present. In our home, you only open Christmas presents on Christmas morning, on Christmas day. No opening presents before that. That's, that's our tradition, that's our rule. I don't know what yours is. So I've come to think of, of Christmas presents a little bit like, or miracles rather, a little bit like that gift that some people give their children to open on Christmas Eve before Christmas morning arrives. It's a taste of what is to come. It's a hint of what is to come. The real party comes on Christmas Day. The celebrations, the healing, the life then is breaking in and it's bubbling over through the life of Jesus. But it's nothing in comparison to the hope of a new heaven and a new earth that we will each experience one day with him. So the Christmas Eve pajamas are great, but just wait until Christmas morning. That picture of an absurdly generous Jesus who's brimming with life, it doesn't really square with the views that many of us have of a God who is power hungry or abusive or absent. And many of us cling tragically onto a view of God that way. Part of hearing, I think, the gospel stories and coming to grips with them is to come to grips with, with Jesus as this relentless hope carrier in the deep places of our being and to begin to hope in the deep places of our being. So these story, stories tell us that God needn't frighten us because at the heart of God's character on show through Jesus is compassion and mercy in abundance and we're invited to hope in that character. This leads us to our, our second question, which is, so what do we do about our fear of death? Well, anyone 
who's had to face death or face the fear of death can tell you that there are no pithy quotes about endurance or inner strength that we can find that really helps. Death brings us to our knees as human beings, just like the characters in this story. So what do we do with our fear? Well, as people of faith, this is again why our vision of Jesus has to be clear. If Jesus is just this super prophet or a character with a bunch of nice teaching, then he doesn't help us with our problem of death and the fear that it causes. But Jesus, as we read in this story, has the audacity to tell the man who's just lost his daughter not to be afraid, but to have faith. That's, that's not just a, a bit of nice advice or teaching. It's not just a coping mechanism. That's an invitation to trust that death is beatable. Now, you know, in hearing Jesus tell the worried father not to be afraid, I also think it's important to say that I don't think we're being told that we shouldn't feel things as people of faith, or even that it's wrong to be afraid of death. Part of being a healthy person is owning and expressing our feelings. Eventually, uh, we have to come to grips with them. As a therapist friend of mine uh, likes to say, uh, ignoring our feelings is like ignoring an upset stomach. You know, something's going to come out eventually, whether or not you like it. So I don't think Jesus is telling this man not to feel fear. I do think that Jesus is confident, confident enough in himself to tell the man that fear doesn't have to be his dominant narrative. And that's because for Jesus, death doesn't get the last word. He does. Jesus simply doesn't believe that Tolstoy's description of death as the inevitable end of everything applies to him. Now, for people who've had to face death through sickness, the loss of a child, or something gut-wrenchingly tragic. This kind of language from Jesus, it isn't sentimental or theoretical. It's deeply personal. And it may not be easy for some of us to hear, even today. Some of you have had to face those, those kinds of tragedies. Some of you are, are coming to grips with death today and you're trusting God that he will bring about life in the end and that death won't get the last word. We heard Dave say last year something that really stuck with me. He said that the story of every Christian is that even though death is ahead of us because of the hope of the gospel, death is also, more importantly, behind us. And that's what stands out to me in this story. So what do we do with our fear of death? Well, first thing we do is we take it seriously. We ask our questions of ourselves, of God. We own it. One of my favorite preachers is described as someone who preaches as if she knows she's dying, which is to say that she faces the truth when she does her work. But when it comes to facing the truth about death as a people of faith, we also face the truth about Jesus as the hope and source of life. We listen to the one who has the last word and tells us to have faith. To have faith that even if death comes, in the end, death can't stop the hope of life that Jesus has in store for all of creation, you and me included. That leads us to our third and final question. What is real faith? If we're supposed to have faith and not be afraid, what, what is real faith? 
I think faith has sadly been misunderstood by many people in many Christian circles. And that's because some people insist on believing that faith has to look heroic or be something that depends on, on us. Ironically, I think that's the opposite of faith, at least the kind of faith that, that we discover in the stories about Jesus in, in the Gospels. Just have faith, Jesus says to the man. What does he mean? Well, it doesn't sound like he's telling the man to muster up some kind of heroic delusion or to prove to Jesus how much faith he has in order to earn a healing. As we see in stories like this one, faith seems to be a lot more like trust. And so confusing, so polluted, has that word faith become in some Christian circles that it might be helpful to substitute it now and then for that other word, trust. Jesus says to the woman, your desperate trust in me is well placed. You're healed. He says to the man who's lost his daughter, don't be afraid, just trust me. And they continue to his home. So at the heart of these intertwined stories, we hear, I think, that faith is trust. Trust in a person who is the source of life itself and promises that what we hear in John's gospel is true, that Jesus has come to give life and give it in abundance. So real faith in the deepest Christian sense, I think, is a, is a trust in the God that we needn't be afraid of because in the end, he's generous with life. Real faith is trust in God who makes dead things live again one day. All things live again one day. The more I pour over stories like these and the more people I meet who are learning to trust God through honestly the most horrible, horrendous of, of things, that the worst stuff that life can throw at us, the more I think that a good definition of faith might be this. It's something that I'm offering up today, just from my own experience and, and reading of scripture. It might not fit for you, but it's, it's been helpful for me. Faith is desperately trusting God without conditions. Faith is desperately trusting God without conditions. When I was uh, 15, a school friend of mine died. She was killed uh, by her only sibling. She was killed by her brother. And that was a terribly confusing and dark time in my life. It lasted for years. Our friend group uh, didn't know what to do with ourselves. Um, there was no healing for my friend. There was no rescue from uh, the agency of evil as life was, was ripped from her. And some of us have had experiences like that. Some of us have sat with the dying or the grieving in hospital rooms and in homes, and we have felt the hot tears on our shoulders and cheeks. We've felt the tremors of loss that, that shake another person's body as we hold them. And in those moments, there's really only two things that we can do and say as people of faith. The first is to say to someone, I'm with you, and just to hold them. And the other is, I'm going to trust God with you. And maybe on the darkest of days, I'm going to trust God for you if you're struggling to trust God yourself. We're just a couple of weeks away from the season of Advent. And as one preacher puts it, Advent begins in the dark. As much as we love to run into 
sparkly Christmas, and lots of people are doing that right now, we are also moving into the darkest time of the year. But in the dark is where we learn to trust and hope that light is coming. So if you've heard this story today and you've heard my words and you're in the dark, if you've heard this and you're daring to trust that God will come through in the end, then please hear Jesus' words, not to be afraid, but to trust him. To trust whether the Christmas Eve pajamas come or not, to trust without conditions that Jesus is the ultimate hope carrier. It's way too early for a Christmas carol, I admit that. But I'm gonna break all of my holiday rules today by sharing just, just one of them, because I think that this carol says it, says it better than I can. Part of Hark the Herald Angels Sing uh, says this. Let me close with, with this verse. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give us second birth. Bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.
Friends, how good it has been today uh, to be together, uh, to worship, uh, to consider the Gospel of Luke series, and to hear some encouraging uh, community announcements. Uh, just before we dismiss, I'm happy to uh, share some community announcements, specifically as it relates to our team, our Living Waters ministry team. Over this past fall, there has been a vacancy on our team as it relates specifically to our women's network leadership. And I have a good announcement to make today. Uh, beginning uh, at the first part of January, uh, Kirsten Annaby, uh, Reverend Kirsten Annaby, uh, will be joining our team uh, to give direction to our women's network. She'll be joining our associate and preaching team. And I am absolutely over excited. Uh, it's going to be so good for Kirsten to join our team. Uh, if you're new or newer to Living Waters, uh, Kirsten and her husband David and three children uh, have been a part of Living Waters for years. Uh, Kirsten has participated faithfully and regularly uh, involved in our women's network. Uh, this is a great lady who joins our team. Uh, her husband David is a professor at Trinity Western and uh, the Annabies are awesome. And we're so excited to be able to announce this to our community. It's been so good uh, this fall. Uh, some of the things that have been happening amongst our women's network just recently, the, the evening of worship, uh, Zoe Network continues to be uh, helping and serving women this fall and will continue in the new year. So excited uh, to be able to announce that today. Please be in prayer uh, for the enemies as they are involved in a little bit of ministerial transition. Uh, Kirsten has served for many, many years with University Christian Ministries, uh, helping um, provide catalytic leadership uh, to our university campuses across our province. And so as she uh, uh, finishes her ministry and transitions towards Living Waters, uh, may you be in prayer uh, for our good friend, Kirsten. Just as we close, I'm just reminded of a statement that Luke made during his message, where he said, faith is trusting God without conditions. And I pray for you uh, today that you would do just that. Join me in doing just that today and tomorrow as we uh, discover all that God has for us this coming week. Know that good things come to those who, who follow the Lord and help others. So God bless you, Living Waters. Thanks for joining us today at Church at Home. Have a great week.